Okay, autonomic nervous system. Um, I want to compare and contrast this to the somatic nervous system, which is relatively simple um, in its uh, setup of synapses and neurotransmitters. But before I get into the specifics of that, I want to make sure that you understand what we mean when we say autonomic nervous system. So um, remember that autonomic nervous system was right here in the story that we were telling. It is part of the efferent nervous system and the primary effectors for the autonomic nervous system are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Um, we don't really talk about the enteric nervous system right now. Um, okay. <clears throat> it um, controls cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Generally speaking... Um, it is often referred to as the involuntary division of the nervous system. Um, part of the reason that it is involuntary is because it is not actually hooked up to your cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex, the outermost portion of your cerebrum, is really the conscious voluntary portion of the brain. Um, whereas the autonomic nervous system um, is actually primarily wired up to the pons, the medulla oblongata and the hypothalamus, none of those are voluntary divisions. Whereas remember the skeletal muscle was wired up to the primary motor cortex, which is the cerebral cortex. So I don't know if you covered that stuff in anatomy. Anyway, it is hooked up to a portion of the brain that is not under voluntary or conscious control. <clears throat> so why do we care about it at all? Well, by controlling these three tissues, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, you are going to be controlling quite a few of the life-sustaining physiological processes. For instance, cardiovascular function, arguably pretty important to sustain your physiology and your homeostasis, um, is cardiac muscle, of course, but it's also the smooth muscle in the vessels. So cardiac and smooth muscle cardiovascular function. What about respiratory function? Respiratory function is, um, well, the diaphragm is not controlled by the autonomic nervous system because it's skeletal muscle. So that's controlled by the somatic nervous system. But the diameter of the bronchioles going to and from the lungs, that's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Digestive function is primarily glandular secretion and smooth muscle contraction. So that's autonomic. Urinary function, blood pressure controls urinary function. That's a lot of smooth muscle activity. And then there's glandular function involved in there as well. And then reproductive function, it's mostly wiggles with smooth muscle and squirts with glands. So these are a lot of the things that end up um, having you seek medical care. So it's good to understand how they're wired up. So um, that's just a little intro, and now I want to go into the concept of dual innervation of the autonomic nervous system. Okay, this sounds complicated. It's not too bad. Um, so with dual innervation, what I want you to understand is that most of your autonomic effector organs, meaning most places that you have smooth muscle glands and then cardiac muscle, um, are dually innervated. <clears throat> so if you look at this figure, it looks really complicated at first, but it's not as bad as you um, as it initially looks. So, for instance, if we look at the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, those are the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, and I'll map those out for you in just a second. Um, those will, for instance, the heart, instead of having one hookup like skeletal muscle does, with skeletal muscle you just stimulate it and excite it or do you just leave it alone? The heart has, mm, let's say, both brakes and gas on it. It's got dual innervation with the autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So most um, autonomic effector organs will have dual innervation with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So let's go back and draw to make sure that you guys understand what the terminology of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system mean. Okay, so. So, um, basically what we are going to do is we're going to have the central nervous system, which is not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about the peripheral nervous system. But conceptually, there is communication two ways between the CNS and the PNS. 
And then we are not focusing on the afferent nervous system, but we can put it in the story. The afferent nervous system gathers information from receptors. Oops, that's not how you spell receptors, Melanie. Receptors sensory receptors, and carries that information through the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system for what the central nervous system does is integration. So if you put your hand on a hot stove, sensory receptors send that information through the afferent nervous system division of the peripheral nervous system, and then you integrate it, and the integration is um, identification, hot, comparison, how hot, too hot, and then um, initiate a motor response, which is where we're, we are in this chapter. So the peripheral nervous system, the other half of it is the efferent nervous system. And the efferent nervous system has these two divisions that we've been talking about, the somatic motor and the effector for the somatic motor is skeletal muscle. Okay, but what about the autonomic? The autonomic motor division, which is where we are, goes to what effectors? It goes to cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands, those are the effectors. Okay, I don't have room to write effectors, but those are the, those are. But um, as you probably learned in anatomy, and let's reinforce, the autonomic motor division has a subdivision, and the subdivisions are the sympathetic division, which will go to, for instance, cardiac muscle, and the parasympathetic which also goes to the same tissue. This is the concept that we were talking about with dual innervation, okay? So um, how people generally refer to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic is, um, and this is showing you a little bit of the anatomy of these, is the sympathetic division is the fight or flight division. You use this during fight or flight situations and exercise. And so what it is going to do is it's going to initiate fight or flight responses in these tissues, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. And then the parasympathetic division um, is often called the feed or breed or rest and digest. So um, what is going to happen? Let me just give you an example so that we can start thinking about this and then we'll actually work on it some more at the end of this set of notes. So what I want you to imagine is um, two different organs, both of which are innervated by the autonomic nervous system. So let's imagine the heart, okay, um, which will have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic hookup. And then let's also imagine the uterus, smooth muscle in the uterus, which would have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic hookup. And then let's imagine um, a tiger walking into the room. And what would happen with each of these? Well, when you're just sitting around and there was no tiger, what is primarily controlling both of those tissues is the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system is going to excite some tissues and inhibit others based on sort of um, resource allocation. Um, so what's going to happen is um, when there is no tiger, the uterus can afford to have smooth muscle contraction. So the parasympathetic nervous system would cause an increase in activity in the uterus. But when there's no tiger, the heart can afford to slow down. So the parasympathetic nervous system would cause a decrease in cardiac muscle activity. Okay, that's what you need when you're doing feed or breed activities. You need your heart to kind of chill out a little bit, but you can afford for your uterus to have contractions. But then a tiger walks into the room. And so now what we have to do is we have to think about resource allocation. And I will reinforce this as we go forward. Resource allocation says, where do I need to spend nutrients and oxygen and energy? Where do I need to spend them? So the sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in and it's going to tell your heart to do what? Is it worth increasing your heart rate if there's a tiger in the room? Hell yeah, it is. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to say we need to increase cardiac muscle activity. But do we need to spend any ATP on uterine contraction at that point? No, 
So the sympathetic nervous system is going to tell the uterus to chill because it doesn't even matter if you have a uterus when a tiger is about to eat you, right? doesn't matter at all. So generally what's going to happen with these um, organs, the, the autonomic effector organs, is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are going to do opposite things to the same organ. And in order to figure out what's going to happen to what organ, I will teach you sort of the resource allocation rule. So it says think resource allocation. We'll talk about that a little bit more now, uh, a little bit more later. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and then we'll do the anatomical route um, from the CNS to the effector in the autonomic nervous system. Basically, we're going to build something like this um, in the next little video.